Bojo, Zonje, Winishe, Wapagwana, Queen, and Dishnikas, Mamamatwa, Minwa, Takaron, Tonin, Donjaba, Makwan, and Dodem, Anishinaabe, Queen, and Dao. My name is Nicole Annie Snash, and I'm the director and co founder of Finding Our Power Together. Um, alongside Maggie, I was also the co investigator on this project that we we're sharing with you today. I'm also a um, PhD student uh, studying social justice, education, and Indigenous health at the University of Toronto, and uh, also hold a master's in early childhood studies and psychology. Um, so my area of expertise is really around Indigenous perspectives of um, health systems, um, working with youth and communities to develop their own strategies to um, support their goals. I'll tell you a little bit about Finding Our Power Together for those of you who might be new to us. Um, Finding Our Power Together is an Indigenous-led nonprofit organization that works to support Indigenous young people across Canada um, with resources and relationships that enable them to thrive, really um, self-determinating what, what support looks like for them. Um, Currently, as a result of COVID-19, we've been moving all of our supports online and are, and are in the process of developing what, what our support looks like in this online environment. We offer a variety of therapeutic and educational programs that are designed to develop community, increase capacity, and promote holistic well-being, um, really centered upon um, supporting young people to develop a life worth living. As a team, we are interdisciplinary, uh, mixed of Indigenous and allied individuals from various uh, disciplines who work collaboratively to support young people and communities through meaningful relationships and supports. And so um, this project really originates from our desire to support young people in ways um, that bring together all of our gifts and strengths. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're here um, to discuss today, and that is our braided approach, which um, comes from the title Wingush Kokad in the Gay. Uh, and this is an Anishinaabe word for a sweet grass braid. And sweet grass um, for Anishinaabe folks is a traditional medicine that is often used um, in purification ceremonies. Um, and really in the stories that we hold as Anishinaabe people, um, sweet grass represents the mother of our, or the hair of our mother earth. Um, sweet grass is a medicine. Um, and really, sweetgrass teaches us about the ability to come together because sweetgrass blades are actually very um, fragile when they're alone. However, when we braid them, and that's what we often do when we're using them for medicines, they become stronger. And so we really wanted to take seriously what it means to work together collaboratively and take the sort of individual strands of various approaches in order to create a strong and integrative approach that really supports Indigenous young people. So why were we interested in thinking about integrative mental health approaches in the first place? Um, I don't know if this, this goes without saying, but um, we have been working for many years on supporting Indigenous young people, particularly in northern parts of our country. Um, we know that our young people are surviving within the context of colonialism and systemic oppression that continues to impact mental and spiritual wellness in Indigenous communities, not only in the sort of intergenerational aspect, but also through front hand or um, first hand experience. We know in many Indigenous communities across Canada and in other places in the world, infrastructure and access issues um, creates gaps in service. So even when people are sort of ready to take that step in their healing journeys, there is often not the infrastructure in place to support mental health outcomes in Indigenous communities. We also know that when Indigenous young people go to these services, there is often a disconnection in the worldviews and approaches that are offered by non-Indigenous practitioners, which creates cultural dissonance and assimilation. So either Indigenous young people need to sort of um, change who they are in order to access a system of services, or they reject that system altogether and then don't get the support that they need. We know that Indigenous youth face a disproportionately high rates of suicide, mental illness, and disability as compared to non-Indigenous Canadians. And we think this is a real issue that um, there are solutions to, to solving it. Particularly in COVID-19, we know that social conditions have been exacerbated, um, resulting in increased ill health and mental health issues in communities who are already experiencing these hardships prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a lack of data on the efficacy of clinical approaches in Indigenous contexts, largely because clinical studies don't necessarily think about Indigenous populations when they're designing their approaches. And conversely, Indigenous approaches don't necessarily have the empirical backing of research in order to state that they are effic efficacious for Indigenous communities, even though um, 
as Indigenous people, we know those those uh, practices to be helpful. Um, there's therefore a need to think about sort of mental health strategies that are integrative, evidence driven and culturally safe. And that's sort of where we came from when we were thinking about how to best support Indigenous young people from a perspective um, that is grounded in research. Our over arching research question when we, we began to think about um, how could we best support young people in COVID-19. We had been working with communities for a number of years on the ground, being with communities, co-developing strategies and really taking a community driven approach, knowing that we needed to act quickly in the COVID-19 pandemic to be able to support tangible resources and tangible support systems for young people, um, but really wanting to do that in a good way. And so Maggie and I um, at the time were students at U of T um, and there was a a call for proposals for community-based research projects that um, there were there was a bit of funding for so that we could really start to dive deep into what already exists and how could we how could we sort of take on different aspects of approaches that we knew to be um, effective. So really we were thinking about what are the distinguishing features of effective mental health strategies with Indigenous youth, particularly with the demographic that we work with, which is those who have experienced suicide or have high rates of suicidal ideation um, and ill health. Um, and so the three approaches that we decided to look into really were targeted towards this particular population. Thanks so much, Nikki. Um, so I think you said it beautifully. Um, this is just kind of a visual for you guys to see, you know, how we filled those gaps. And the purpose of this project is to really address all of the needs Nikki had previously said. Um, you know, not one of these approaches really hits um, all of the pieces that, you know, can create a kind of well-rounded mental health approach for Indigenous youth. So really putting them together and creating that strength was our intention to integrate, you know, with the population in mind um, in a good way. And so, you know, these three pieces, Indigenous healing, DBT practical skills and child and youth practices um, kind of came up organically, you know, a part of our team were really, really diverse um, in where we come from. We have mental health you know, practitioners, we have child and youth workers, we have Indigenous and non-Indigenous members. And so these conversations started happening pretty organically. And it was like, huh, you know, you know, we see this, we see some benefits anecdotally in like working in our fields. However, like, what does the literature say? And really, we pulled from the literature to kind of support what we thought or what we saw. And the three pieces, you know, really fell together. Um, you know, I can speak from a DBT perspective is that, you know, we see a lot of suicidality, impulsivity, substance use disorder within Indigenous communities. And DBT, um, which we'll get into a little bit later, was primarily established to address those concerns. Um, we see Indigenous healing, you know, this is such a diverse topic in and of itself, right? There's not this heterogeneity. Um, there is like a lot of heterogeneity within and amongst cultures. So really pulling in and knowing who you're working with and how you're working with them. And also this child and youth kind of fell into place because, you know, it really wraps it all together. This is such a relational practice. Unlike mainstream mental health kind of things on their own, being very individualized, very manualized, a child and youth center practice really targets this relational idea and bringing in community and advocating for and with and so that's really why we selected these three to move forward. Um, and Nikki's going to get into some of our methods and we'll move on from there. Great. So um, we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, and I want to just share with you really how we came to arrive at this braided approach. Um, and this was a phased project that we've actually been working on for over a year now. And so we're really excited to have you here today to be able to share um, some of our findings, some of our experiences, and hopefully hear from you about how um, these findings can influence your own practice with young people. So really we wanted to develop a program and that was always our mission from the outset was to understand practice from a research perspective for the purposes of developing a program. And we wanted to do this in a phased process. So phase one was conducting three simultaneous systematic literature reviews on those three um, content areas that Maggie just talked about earlier. So we did um, Indigenous healing as a mental health practice, DBT as a mental health practice with Indigenous populations, and a CYC approach with uh, Indigenous young people. 
from those literature reviews, we did some analysis and uh, those helped us to think about what were the defining features and the sort of overarching themes that would help us to talk to youth workers about their experiences. Um, and so from that, we went into phase two and we conducted key informant consultations, which we'll talk about uh, later on in the presentation as well, with some of our team members and youth workers who we know have had extensive experiences with Indigenous young people using these various approaches. Um, from that, we sort of solidified our, our themes or principles and began to develop our own program and design. And this is um, what we're calling the Building Our Bundle program, which is one of our programs that Finding Our Power Together um, delivers online during COVID-19. And now uh, we're in phase four, which is synthesizing all of the data that we've gathered through these various phases in order to share them with you. So just a quick overview. Um, from the data sources that we initially conducted in phase one, which is three simultaneous um, systematic literature reviews. So really we wanted to see, you know, what were these approaches specifically looking at um, with Indigenous populations? We know that Indigenous youth are a particular um, population that require um, sort of unique approaches. And we wanted to know what had already been done with this population from these various perspectives. What we found was that actually there was limited data. Um, so you can see that in each of these categories on the table that is shown on screen right now, um, the number of articles that we ended up finding were relatively low. So from 19 articles on the lower side and 33 articles on the higher side. Um, however, these 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 sources of information really did provide us with a framework of seeing what were the emerging themes or what were the emerging practices. Um, and so we took each of those systematic literature, re literature reviews and did some analysis on um, those groupings of articles in order to see, you know, are there commonalities across these three disciplines? Are there differences? Are there things that, you know, keep coming up that we should be integrating into our practice? And so you can see on the right hand side, the emerging themes that came through each of these individual literature reviews. Obviously, of particular importance to us was sort of thinking about how to um, meaningfully engage with Indigenous healing practices. Um, knowing that Indigenous healing is a very um, place and culturally specific practice um, that is adaptive and that is um, in encouraging sort of identity work, cultural work, spiritual work. Um, and so we wanted, we know that this is not a well um, documented or studied practice, nor should it be. Um, but we wanted to see sort of what were the potentially core concepts to an Indigenous mental health practice. Um, we sort of took certain pieces of this practice to be sort of grounding our work. A number of our team members are Indigenous practitioners themselves, and so they operate from this place already. But we also wanted to see what were the components to Indigenous healing that potentially non-Indigenous folks could take on in their practice without appropriating Indigenous knowledge. So you can see the themes on the bottom there of culture, identity, interconnectedness, two-eyed seeing, relationships, land, mindfulness, strength-based approaches, holism, and balance. And I mean, for our Indigenous folks in the room, this probably is not surprising, but there is a lack of empirical evidence in the research about Indigenous practices but much of the evidence did support the integration of Indigenous models into mainstream mental health systems. Thanks so much, Nikki. Um, so we also looked at DBT or dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and first, I just want to give you guys, you know, a brief overview, you know, why we selected this. We started talking about DBT and, and we really emphasized this, that it was developed to address, you know, suicidality, impulsivity, substance use disorder. That's kind of its main target. Um, and really it comes from this place of like a biosocial theory, you know, positing that um, genetically we're born into the world this certain way. So like emotionality and reactivity. Um, but there's also this huge emphasis on, you know, mental mental illness and mental unwell, like not being well mentally isn't just you know, because we're born that way. It's largely to do with invalidating environments. And when we see Indigenous peoples and Indigenous youth, there's so much invalidation they experience due to colonialism. And so really like this mainstream kind of manualized treatment actually is pretty holistic in the way it views the development of mental illness or mental unwellbeing. 
And so we really wanted to share that with you guys. It kind of just all started to fit. Um, it really holds this premise of dialectics, which is understanding that there are two extremes in the world and um, building this balance or finding a middle path is really the way to you know, build a life worth living. Um, there are four main modules within dialectical behavior therapy. Mindfulness is a key foundational kind of module. Distress tolerance, emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, and walking the middle path. And so, you know, empirically, we see that all of these components together really like the outcomes for those who struggle with suicidality, impulsivity, you know, are, are really, it's, it's actually like prescribed or it's very efficacious. Efficacies. I just made that up. There's a lot of efficacy supporting it. However, we don't see a lot of studies, you know, with Indigenous peoples as sample populations or, you know, working with this group. And the ones that we did find were mostly from the states. The sample size was really small. That being said, we did get 19. Um, and from these, you know, these themes were kind of embedded. I think the way in which they are embedded is really important to note. You know, we see mindfulness, culture, identity, um, understanding emotions, emotion regulation, coping, and positive relationships. Um, the way in which these themes presented themselves in the article were very much in line with culture. So not using like a traditional mindfulness, but instead really bringing in culture, bringing in family, bringing in environment. Um, within it, like within um, mindfulness practice, um, bringing in elders and communities to teach the skills, not necessarily having people come in who are not of the culture and, develop, and delivering these skills in a manualized way, but being flexible. So we started to see that and it was like, hmm, you know, okay, okay, some people are kind of on the same page as us. Um, when we look at DBT, we see that it can be kind of dispersed, adapted, um, and that's really why we chose it. And it was it was a good thing to see in the literature and it should be noted that there's not a lot of it. And so that kind of further pushed us to develop this integrative approach. So knowing that indigenous populations, you know, have symptomology that would benefit from a clinical approach like DBT and also recognizing that indigenous communities really do want cultural resurgence and cultural approaches. We also saw that there is sort of a missing piece about who are the people who are, who are best suited to be delivering this type of intervention. And so we do a lot of work with young people. We uh, work with a lot of youth workers. And so we actually thought that a CYC approach or a youth-centered approach would really be a beneficial way to think about how do we deliver services for young people that are really youth-centered um, and really allow for meaningful engagement and meaningful relationships. So we wanted to look more closely at a CYC approach, um, knowing that CYC is a relatively newer profession, um, but is distinct from other professions like social work um, and education, and that this is a, 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 a unique position in the lives of young people, where we could actually have uh, quite a bit of impact on the lives of young people. So. Um, Again, not surprisingly, there were relatively few articles on CYC practices with Indigenous youth. However, there were um, more than other, other of our searches. Um, however, the ways in which CYC practice is documented is not necessarily empirical, meaning that there wasn't necessarily studies um, that were conducted about the effic efficacy of um, CYC as a practice in the lives of young people. However, there was a lot of discussion in literature about CYC um, cultural competency and how non-Indigenous CYCs enter into the spaces of Indigenous young people. Um, we also thought that this practice of being a, a helper in the lives of young people was really uh, aligned with Indigenous models of healing and Indigenous cultural um, sort of roles in communities. And so this was a really interesting point to kind of bring everything together. The most common themes in this cohort were about relational practice. Relational practice is a core um, component of CYC as a profession. And it's really about building relationships with young people that are meaningful, um, that are healthy, that model appropriate behavior, um, and that act as a caveat for change in the lives of young people. Um, other themes were trauma-informed practice, meaning-making, um, youth-centeredness, and strength-based approaches. Um, 
and really sort of the ways that these practices were taken up by CYCs were varied. And there were a, a lot of different intervention styles that could take place, which was really interesting for us to start to think about how we could be um, supporting young people in a therapeutic process. Um, you know, CYCs engage in arts-based therapies, school-based therapies, land-based therapies, um, center-based therapies, residential type therapies. And so um, we really saw that this is an opportunity for us to be developing a, an approach um, in the lives of young people where they are at, wherever they are at. Yeah, and I mean, I think there are just so many features from all three of these that start to overlap. And I know we're, we're just ripping through information and um, thinking back on it and just preparing for this, you know, webinar, it's pretty mind blowing, right? That so many of the, like these three, like they're kind of like stances, right? It's really about how you're, how you're approaching clients and what are these key aspects? Um, and the overlap is just it's it's really interesting coming from three different fields to just have this overarching thing and really that was our vibe is to try and say no matter what profession you are situated in if you come you know from these places with these intentions then hopefully meaningful change can be made in the the lives of indigenous youth all right let me just check out my slide okay so as nikki shared part of our methods was um to conduct key informant interviews to really gain perspective, right? This is part of like our triangulation to really like build some validity into this study and not just draw from the research, right? We started kind of with this anecdotal conversation and like, hey, you're seeing this, you're seeing this. And we're like, okay, let's pull in the research. And then we're like, okay, let's go back out into the field. And so that was a really, really big part for us, um, really kind of having this this piece, like, are we, are we member checking? Are we like actually getting the voices that should be heard or need to be heard? Those who practice with indigenous use, those who actually work in the community and work with some of these really intense issues in helping and assisting indigenous youth, such as suicide, such as substance use disorder, trauma, colonialism, identity, right? And so from these um, key informant interviews, they were semi-structured. Um, and we asked professionals from each field. Um, first, we asked, what's their experience working with Indigenous people, specifically Indigenous youth? You know, what is your experience? You know, have you just done a webinar? Do you, have you learned about it in school versus, or university or trainings versus actually sit, sitting in a community, getting to know the people um, and that? So we got like a wide, a wide variety of experiences, which was nice. We also asked, what principles do you currently kind of carry in to your work? Like as a social worker, you know, there are certain principles that were actually taught through our professional colleges. And, and so every profession really has those, but not only professionally, personally, where are you pulling your principles from? How are you entering a room? How are you entering a, a space of being a teacher um, and being a learner? And then we asked, what and how are you implementing the principles, right? So not only like talking the talk, but how are you walking in that way, in that, like with that intention and following a path? Um, so from this, we got a whole bunch of information. And from that, we started to pull the literature and pull the, the information and the data gathered from the key informant interviews. And that's where these themes kind of transformed into more principles, principle-like. So things that you carry with you, um, things to note while in practice. And so we came up with seven, which we're gonna go into right after this, um, but there were like really interesting uh, findings that kind of added on to the seven key principles we're going to talk about. For most of them, it was having a strong team. So being a part of a multi-diverse mental health team or youth practitioner team or really anyone, right? And we really see this like re relationality transcend. So not only are we saying encourage relationality or seeing that it's so important to bolstering mental health and mental wellness of Indigenous youth, we're also seeing it with the practitioners, right? We need support too. We are in a relational practice. And so that was like so intense. And specifically it was around dialogue, dialogue around suicidality, right? It is a reality that in working with 
Um, I mean, at least in my experience and, you know, working with indigenous youth and or indigenous people, people who've been marginalized um, and colonialism, like there is a lot of suicidality. And so having conversations about that, being able to say the words, speak the unspoken is so paramount. You know, when we, when we don't feel comfortable talking about it within our team, how can we actively encourage and embrace and empower youth around acknowledging that, yeah, this is the reality. And sometimes these are things that they struggle with. Um, also burnout. So not speaking about suicidality, also increased burnout. Cause it was like, how can I tiptoe around this thing that is so obvious in my practice? Um, and also just how, how to deal with it. You know, if unfortunately, you know, someone does die by suicide that you're working with that, you know, what is the healing process? How do you heal? How do you really engage in that morning um, and not just move on? Um, secondly, you know, we saw this from a lot of our um, younger members of our team and also like me as well, um, really rooting yourself in your practic practitioner positionality. What is your culture, right? Um, where do you come from? What is your social identity? And really saying it in an empowered way. Um, as a non-Indigenous practitioner, you know, from mainstream culture, I'm all, you know, we often hear like, oh, I don't really have a culture. Well, that is a culture, right? The mainstream culture is indeed a culture. So really like getting comfortable with talking about these things, investigating, right? And while doing that, really balancing, not taking up too much space, right? And, and that's a tough thing to navigate. It's, it's very, it's hard, right? When you, when you first start. And so it's practicing, it's checking with your diverse team, you know, not putting too much onus because it's not their job to educate. And also, you know, being in dialogue. Um, we also saw that like for practitioners working with youth, a huge piece with indigenous youth was the relationality again, right? Like we're back, but really in a non-hierarchical way. So, you know, a lot of manualized treatments where we come from Western mental health approaches are like, this is your homework. These are your skills. Do them. I'll see you at five o'clock every Wednesday. And so it really was not about that. It was actually dropping the rope and letting the rules and like not the boundaries, but being flexible in the relationship and not adhering so strictly was key. So self-disclosing in an intentional and effective way, you know, for the, for the purpose of the youth to really build the foundation of a secure attachment first. It was relationship first. And when you go in with this Western mindset or this like really prescriptive, non-flexible vibe, it really didn't give space. It was like, okay, hi, I'm Maggie let's like do your homework, right? And so that kind of had to be dropped and really facilitate a relationship, an authentic one that took quite a, quite a while. And we saw that amongst them within the professionals we talked to. It was like, I had to drop the rope and build a relationship first and build trust. And lastly, oh, I guess this goes with it, you know, this adaptability. So it was really hard, you know, if, if working, you know, with indigenous youth, like through Zoom, you know, the resources aren't there. So like, can you do Zoom? If they don't have Zoom, are you willing to use the telephone? Are you willing to meet every other week? Um, the flexibility is so key. Um, and we see that kind of all of all of these additional findings we found are, are really big tenants in all three of the um, approaches we're taking. So like flexibility, finding a middle path. And so it was, it's interesting to see how so, like specifically GPT is manualized and it really encourages such flexibility. Um, I'm obviously coming from a GPT perspective. So like Maggie said, we essentially did three literature reviews, came up with some emerging themes from each of those in isolation, and then brought those three literature reviews together to kind of think about overarching themes, talk to our uh, key informants about, you know, are these actually themes that come up in your own uh, practice? Are these principles that you follow within your own practice? Um, and so from those sort of sources together, we then um, synthesized that information and created the principles of our braided approach. And these are the principles that we have chosen, we have elected to take on as a, a team at Finding Our Power together, um, but also that are very much supported by the literature in all of those um, sectors, as well as our key informants. So these are the themes we're going to talk about in this next bit here culture, interconnection, relationality, self-discovery and determination, holism, balance and balance restoration, and specificity. So first I'll start with culture. 
So culture as how we are defining culture is um, respecting the customs, practices, and beliefs of Indigenous nations, peoples, or social groups. And we want to promote culture by incorporating Indigenous teachings, values, languages into our mental health practice where appropriate. And from what we had discussed with our key informants as well as the literature, um, there kind of is two co core components to culture. One of them is around cultural connectedness. So cultural connectedness referring to the degree to which someone feels connected to their culture or part of their cultural group. And we know from research that cultural connectedness is considered across disciplines as a substantial protective factor for Indigenous young people. Um, increased feelings of connections to one culture supports youth in developing resiliency in the face of challenging circumstances, as well as having the relationships and the um, sort of healing mechanisms to support them if something um, challenging does happen. Um, we also know that cultural connectedness is a sort of practice that Indigenous nations are really concerned with at this moment in time as, you know, intergenerational trauma has made it so that many of us are learning our cultures as adults or learning our cultures later in life because of the sort of impacts of colonization um, and all of those fun things that come with that. The other um, key aspect to culture is around cultural safety. So um, particularly non-Indigenous practitioners talk about sort of the awkwardness of discussing culture in their practices or not knowing how to approach culture um, as being a non-Indigenous practitioner. And so, um, so sort of throughout the conversations and the literature, we kept seeing the need for cultural safety. And cultural safety really refers to you know, the um, approaches that ensure that a person doesn't need to leave their culture at the door when they approach that service. And really that is about sort of the comfortability of the person interacting with that service um, to feel safe, to feel as though they can explore culture in the therapeutic relationship should they desire to. It's not the same as saying that every service needs to have, um, you know, feathers and, and and whatever on it, it's it's really about creating a space where culture is something that is um, encouraged, incorporated if desired, um, and is a conversation that is worth having. Like Maggie said, for non-Indigenous practitioners, a key component of cultural safety is about acknowledging your own privilege, acknowledging your own position, and acknowledging the cultural stance that you come with. So even Indigenous um, practitioners also engage in this process where they acknowledge where their teachings come from or where they're at in their learning journey and what they are able to offer in terms of culture, really taking an unbiased, non-judgmental approach. Um, our second theme was that of interconnection, um, understanding that like human beings are connected to one another, right, um, to the earth and to even non-human entities. And so you know, we see that a lot within um, Indigenous ways of knowing, Indigenous principles, um, you know, bringing in ancestry, community, land, spirits. Um, and this really was something that, you know, mirrored that of DBT as well. It's this idea that like more, not just one truth exists, right? So really it, letting that be in the room. Right. Even like an understanding that that is a part or may be a part. Right. Offering that and bringing it into the room. Like Nikki said, like it's really about just kind of sitting in it and be like, I don't know about that. And so how can we connect? Um, it's a it's like one of these strategies. There are complex relationships, especially when we look at Indigenous youth, um, you know, we're going back to history again, colonization, the 60s scoop, you know, how are these interconnected pieces, you know, broken and how do we connect them to create, you know, to help really position someone as a whole, like as an identity, as a person. And it's really important um, to honor it as, you know, an integral part of positive mental health outcomes. And so this last piece we say, you know, we encourage this by welcoming, welcoming relationships with the land ancestors and spirit into our mental health practice. That can look like so many things, right? It can even look like taking a walk with the youth you're working with, you know, sitting in a park, you know, being flexible again within the systems we work and how we serve youth. Um, define or ask youth how they define their community. What is community within themselves, you know, within the land? How does it look? You know, how do they relate to others? What are their spiritual beliefs? How do they cope? Um, and ask, right? A huge piece is like, 
how can we ask Indigenous youth who they want to be involved? Oftentimes we see on intake forms and, and all that jazz, it's like parent, right? We have to acknowledge that like within Indigenous communities, you know, some indig individuals, even outside, even with non-Indigenous peoples, right? Individuals live with aunties, um, uncles, caregivers, cousins, right? Like invite those people into the space, right? People don't exist in, in isolation. And with Indigenous youth, um, you know, even an elder in the community, whether or not there's a blood relation, like who is someone in their community they look to? Like ask about it, bring it in. Maybe you're off base. Um, and in that case, you can, you know, repair. Um, but better to ask than to just withhold and kind of sit in this place of sitting in the unspoken. Yeah, um, I think too, um, for Indigenous folks, um, particularly our Indigenous young people, um, what I've seen from so many of our young people is the feeling of disconnection um, and the disconnection becoming so intense that it results in um, falling out of life. Um, and so really thinking about interconnection um, allows us to begin to see ourselves as something bigger than um, just as individuals, um, to feel connected to others, to feel connected to creation. And so this really re relates to uh, another theme, which is relationality. And relationality could, you know, you can consider as the practical application of interconnectedness. It's about how we nurture, maintain, um, build, grow, um, all of the complex relations that people hold with all of creation. Um, so as practitioners, we seek to develop caring, reciprocal, and respectful relationships with, with the self and others in order to nurture those connections we have. So even as practitioners, we need to understand that we are part of a greater web of relation. We need to trust that our helpers will, will also be there. We need to ensure that we are maintaining our positive relationships in our lives so that we are able to model that for young people and so that when we are with young people we really can establish meaningful trust um, and to encourage them to start to build sort of the relational effectiveness skills that are going to enable them to navigate the world um, and we know that so many young people really depend on their peers they depend on other relationships in order to get by. And then when there's a rift in those relationships, it can be really um, devastating to young people. So relationality is really about, you know, how do we practice relationships? How do we learn how to be in relation, not only with the people in our immediate lives, but with our clans, if we have clans, with, with spirit, with land, with creator, um, with each other, with the self. And really so um, developing those really meaningful relationships as a web of support. Part of this relationality bit, I just want to touch on, you know, I think Nikki just outlined it beautifully and it's really within a relationship, right? Like we work with Indigenous youth, not as yes men, like, right? Like we're not there to agree all the time. And so these relationships are really, really, you know, essential in modeling and teaching boundaries and you know, bolstering like self-respect in these things. And so working with Indigenous youth, you know, it's about being a human, right? Not being the one who has all the knowledge. And I think that really, you know, is so key and brings us to, you know, this twofold idea of self-discovery and self-determination. Um, and really, you'll see that these themes start to like stack overlap and then um, like we're really hammering it home. A lot of them overlap, but they all weave together. And so it's really about promoting this um, learning about oneself. Um, and then self-determination is the ability to act on behalf of the self and make wise decisions in line with one's values. So, you know, self-discovery is this critical examination of the past and the present. So our youth that you're working with you know, okay to go back and really acknowledge what happened, you know, where they are actually situated in this world within, you know, the territory they come from, the community, like what has happened, right? Colonialism, you know, there are disadvantages. And just as much as, you know, it's important to recognize privilege, it's also important to really let youth know that they lack those privilege and it takes the onus off of um, kind of absorbing all of the blame and all of the shame. So really helping them discover how they've been impacted by the environment, but also like who they are. And like actively we can 
we're like leaning in, we're leaning in with individuals, we're leaning in with youth, um, introducing emotion words, introducing ways that they can like describe an experience and also listening, asking them first, how do you know about this emotion? What do you know? Do you know any teachings or how would you right, come up with a, a, a descriptor for sadness, anger? And so it's offering information, but also sitting back and encouraging them to give this idea. Um, and when we go to self-determination, it's making choices, right? And so it's not doing for, just like um, I had previously said, it's, it's offering info, offering ideas, but really scaffolding, right? Swimming alongside or being alongside someone, not just handing them, handing them this stuff and saying like, here, right? Like letting youth determine what they want for themselves, what steps they want to take, what do they want their path to look like moving forward versus the shoulds or the should nots that sometimes from a Western perspective, we might assign. This is what you should do. This is the outcome. Um, we really need to acknowledge that, you know, and be an advocate. And this is where our CYC piece comes so in, right? Giving the voice, empowering. This is where we start to like shift to this, like bolstering, this like strong empowerment. Like this is your life. Yes, things have happened. And, you know, you are an active participant. And so when we look at this, we're really leaning in, we're providing information, rationale about the mind and the body and the spirit, how they interact, how the environment and ourselves interact. Um, and so there's a lot of places you can go with this, um, but the key is to really the self first of the youth, not the practitioner. I think also a key, a key component of understanding the self is understanding the entirety of ourselves. Um, and so this is where holism comes into play. So holism refers to the consideration of the entirety of a person, which includes not only their mental state, but also their physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects simultaneously. So it's important when working with Indigenous youth to consider the complex impacts that result from adverse experiences. An adverse event does not only occur in isolation, rather symptoms that are categorized as mental health concerns may be caused by or facilitate phys physiological, emotional, and spiritual distress. And so mental health professionals can support clients to explore and identify the ways that these stressors are impacting them in their various realms of being um, and promote more fulsome healing um, by thinking about these in, in sort of um, tandem with one another. Particularly for Indigenous um, worldviews, we understand that, you know, there are four aspects of the self or the mental, physical, spiritual. Um, I always forget one. I feel like everybody always does that. Mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical selves. Um, and largely when we think about mental health as a practice, we are really just engaging with maybe one or two. So the mental or cognitive part of a person as well as the emotional part of a person. When actually we know um, that these things are all linked together. Our physical health uh, and our mental health are, are very much intertwined. So is our spiritual health and our mental health. Um, and so we don't often think in sort of mainstream mental health practices about the spiritual well-being of our clients. So when we're working with young people from a holistic approach, we want to investigate with them the different parts of themselves and how they see, understand, and relate to these parts. It's important to help them to get in touch with their bodies, um, their spirits, their minds, and their hearts, and to be able to sort of support them in developing skills in connecting and um, potentially shifting their focus to another realm. Something that has been really sort of interesting for us to think about is that potentially when we are focusing too much on one one of the aspects of the self, the other self, the other parts sort of get neglected. And so really holism allows us to think about all of these things in, in balance with one another. And it's through holism, right? So first acknowledging a person as a whole, right? Uh, this really like strengths-based approach. Like who are you as a whole, not what part of you is lacking, right? And that's really where we're going from this strengths is we're going from this like clinical, like what are we fixing to this really like, this is you as a whole. It's really about building harmony in these different aspects as Nicole was talking about. So once you can recognize all of these different pieces, what needs attention, right? Yes, you might be there for, you know, you might be seeking support um, for mental health or for, you know, seeking a job. Um, that's great. And as practitioners and the ones kind of in this position of 
of knowing and, and being asked to be a helper, we need to acknowledge, we need to orient those we work with to the other places, right? You might come in for sleep and you might really like, you know, draw out of a youth that like, maybe this other area is really what's getting you. And so we want to build balance and like live a more harmonious life. And living in har harmony or minimum is um, really orienting the self towards building balance within our relationships, our environments across these spectrums. Um, and that key concept, you know, directly mirrors one in DBT. So it's walking this middle path, finding balance, building balance, right? It's not, it's, it recognizes that unwellness or, or suffering or pain really comes from sitting on either side of a polarized spectrum. So not everything needs to be yes, no, right? This kind of way we live in society, but in fact, balance and like a sense of relief comes when we, when we can live in the grays. And so really when we can acknowledge that there's something off kilter, right? By exploring the whole person, we can kind of help youth self self discover and self determine the ways in which they want to restore that balance. And so, really, you want to have these active discussions. So, in practice, you want to open this open this floor, like help explore. Be like, okay, I know I know you really want to talk about this, and let's get some more information on this. These are the reasons why we are more than just this piece. And these are the reasons why I think it's so providing some psychoeducation, providing some indigenous, you know, ways of knowing and indigenous healing methodologies, if, you know, if, if appropriate, right? We want to make sure as a non-indigenous practitioner, we're not offering or over-educating someone on their own culture. Um, you know, that's really, really important. So asking, being, being curious, right? And so, some one of our colleagues had mentioned, you know, she often does bring in the medicine wheel. She is an indigenous um, youth worker, and this is something she uses with younger individuals. Um, so that has worked for her. You know, we can even build balance in things, especially for youth these days. I sound like I'm 80, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> you know, building balance in things like cell phone usage, you know, video games, ways to like escape. So especially in COVID. Right, and really adjusting with COVID. So maybe video game usage pre-COVID might look a lot different than now or cell phone usage, right? So we need to be really flexible and acknowledge the context and acknowledge the changing environments. Yeah, I think all of these things are also so important to think about in context. And so one of the key principles that we've come up against a lot um, is about context specificity. So really knowing how to adapt um, the approaches that we're using in order to address different contexts, different realities, different priorities, um, different cultures, different life ways. So, um, you know, as a practitioner, we want to actively acknowledge environmental and historical factors that have and continue to impact each individual and their um, live reality and adapt to suit the specific needs of the individuals and the community. So like Maggie was talking about with the key informant interviews, really it's about being flexible, it's about being adaptive. There is no one size fits all approach. And so, you know, we are describing these as principles and these principles are really meant to, you know, take on their own lives in terms of whoever is practicing them. They need to adapt. There is no way to say that there's a formulaic approach to supporting Indigenous youth mental health. And I think that was our main takeaway is that, you know, we really need to reach young people where they're at. We want them to explore themselves, explore what they want to explore, um, and to make decisions that are going to be meaningful to them in their own lives. And we are the ones that need to adapt. We need to be flexible. We need to reach them. We need to do whatever we need to do in order to be the best helpers that we can be. It's not up to the youth to sort of fit into our model of care, rather as uh, people who want to be helpers, who want to walk a path of healing with someone, we need to kind of adapt our, our stepping to match theirs um, and really sort of orient ourselves to being a helper that's really just here for a part of the journey. Um, and so we're going to adapt, we're going to be flexible, we're going to ask the questions about how people want to be engaging with us, about what approaches work for them and what doesn't, and being okay with the answers and moving forward alongside in partnership with young people. Yeah, beautifully said, Vicky. And and um, <clears throat> yeah, so following, you know, it is, it is a balanced restoration as a clinician too, right? So again, not being a yes man, but also like, 
hearing, listening actively, pulling in suggestions and, you know, really challenging, right? Like we also are there to help. And so if we go along the same cycle and just say like, yeah, 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 all the time, we're really not, we're not, we're not pushing the self-discovery. We're not, we're not empowering, you know, we're just coasting with them. Um, and, you know, I, I know this is like, I heard Nikki just say like, you know, be flexible. I don't know how many times you can say it. I feel like it's like the big, it's like such a key takeaway here. And, and that can feel super icky for, for people, you know, in, for practitioners, helpers, youth workers in any field, right? Because, you know, the dominant society and, you know, the institutions we're educated in are like, there is a prescriptive way. And so when you get out into the world and you're like, well, what do you mean? Right? What, what do you mean there's no way? It can feel, there's so much discomfort. And so it's really kind of acting in opposite to, to following so strictly um, at the cost of maybe a young person's well being. So it's really being in the moment, being in the environment, and sitting with the person and kind of releasing a bit of those this isn't the way and what do you mean? And, and so I totally want to acknowledge that it is anxiety provoking. It's this unlearning, right? From going from an institution to really being with someone. Like I said, we've been working on this, this sort of approach for about a year now. And, you know, research is great because it's what funders want. It's what people want. They want evidence-based strategies. They want X, Y, Z. We already kind of knew the sort of underlying principles we wanted to sort of engage with in our practice. And so um, this research project really enabled us to just essentially solidify, you know, what were the approaches that we were already doing with young people? Um, and we started this while we were already in, I think, the first season of our Building Our Bundle program. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that. So Building Our Bundle is a online uh, mental health program intended for Indigenous young people across Canada between the ages of 14 and 29. These sessions are co-facilitated by Indigenous and non-Indigenous practitioners um, who have a variety of disciplines, um, skills, and gifts to share. Um, and really the, the intention of the program is for uh, Indigenous young people to learn teaching skills and different practices and activities that can support them in their well-being. Um, and so this is premised on an understanding of, you know, a traditional bundle or a collection of tools that you might pick up in your life journey. Um, we've been now doing this uh, program for the last year, and recently this session, we decided to, to be more intentional about how we are going to integrate the DBT skills in this practice. Um, Maggie has been one of our um, primary co-facilitators of that program, as well as working with um, some of our traditional knowledge holders and Indigenous practitioners on the team. So she's going to share a bit about what that experience has looked like. So really principles and practice, you know, I came up with five keywords here. I thought it was a really cool list um, to kind of like really reflect on how we've been implementing these like actually, right? Like, again, we're going from this like theoretical idea to like actually like, so what, you know, I find it most helpful when theory turns into practice and it's like, how do I do it? Not just like this this thing that floats around and, you know, and so really what I've seen in working with, you know, some of my closest friends um, and like Indigenous knowledge keepers and the other members of our team is that in this group, you know, it's really about situating yourself. You know, we've talked about this repeatedly throughout this webinar, but like knowing yourself, knowing where you come from, knowing the principles that you learned um, through whatever education, through whatever teachings you've received, um, and and really knowing your gifts, right? So like, what are your strengths? Um, and bringing that to the table and modeling, right? So when you have this kind of idea and you've done the self-discovery and you know where you, where, where you are situated um, and can talk and speak the unspoken and are comfortable in doing so, it models you know, for a lot of these Indigenous youth who are really struggling, right, with this identity piece um, due to oppression, due to like colonialism, you know, constant invalidation within and amongst different institutions, you know, like it, it models this, this piece of who I am and these are my gifts. And so the first word here is really situate and I can't stress that enough. 
Secondly, we have relate. So in practice, you know, relating, drawing upon your team members, noting that again, you know, as we had said earlier, like it's a relational practice, not only for the indigenous youth, right? Not only saying like, who do you relate to yourself? You know, what are the non-human entities that you relate to? How do you bring in ancestors? But also as a practitioner, how am I relating? How am I drawing in my team? You know, we have two facilitators on the team, um, for the last you know bit that i've been working in bob and it's myself and a close friend who's a traditional indigenous storyteller and knowledge keeper and helper and i will actively you know relate say like hey from my perspective this is a thing what do you think about that you know where are you coming from and you know how are we relating right let's not be so like divisive you know, us versus them and, and really, but like, actually when we take time and ask questions, it starts like, there are so many commonalities, right? You know, we all live on the planet. I mean, I don't, we, we are all interconnected. And so really inviting that in, um, with care, right? So also acknowledging if we've situated ourselves properly, you know, you are not inserting yourself, you are extending a gift and, you know, and, and waiting for the invitation to walk in, um, especially as a non-Indigenous practitioner. I don't know if I already said that, but that is like very paramount. It's saying I can speak for me. You know, it's this idea that I am not just a teacher in this group or in practice. And even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, not just a group, I am a learner, right? You hold power. You are the expert of your own life. And so I give a gift. Who else has gifts? Everyone, right? And so be ready to like, receive them and also like point them out you know we see that like a lot of the indigenous youth like don't know their gifts and so a lot of the group i'm like oh see what you just did there wow that is that is a gift right and like just like little nuggets i might not say that directly but i'm saying like wow you know you're so good at like making others in the group feel welcome and and so it's bolstering it's empowering and so that's our really you know you can take these words how however you'd like but these are just the things that i've seen and they are so multifaceted um third we have advocate right so you know we do work with a lot of youth um and young adults like within the bob who have a lot of barriers right so while group work is great and we're really focusing on teaching these like practical skills um there are a lot of barriers. And so part of it is, you know, working, helping them one-on-one -on -one or outside of group to really like navigate the very realistic barriers that happen in their life, you know, bolstering them, making their voices being heard, planning. Um, so sometimes this can look like casework. Um, and also like, I don't know everything, right? <laughs> like that is a huge piece. It is who can we bring in from your community? Would it be helpful? for us to link you up with an elder in your community. Would you want to, you know, speak to someone else? I don't know. And so like that is, it is like being vulnerable, being able to look at yourself and say, I don't know this, but let's get you. Let's get you hooked up with somebody who does. Um, and it really highlights other people's gifts. And so um, <clears throat> that's kind of the advocate piece. Um, the participate, you know, I brought that word in here and, and really it's because in talking to um, my indigenous colleague in group, you know, I'm like, well, wh what do I do as a non-indigenous individual if one of one of the kids I'm working with or youth I'm working with really wants to seek out that traditional knowledge? And he's like, well, you know, I can do that. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like I'll link you guys up and you can do it. So it's part of advocating. And, you know, he made this very, like this comment that like, I'm gonna carry with me forever, you know? Um, it's not only like linking up, it's also being like, hey, would you be comfortable if I came too? right? It really shows that like, I want to learn. I want to participate in that with you. Um, you know, he had suggested like, you know, maybe we'll go on a walk or like do some land stuff. And I was like, okay, have fun. And he's like, well, you should come, right? Like you're asking a youth to engage. And so you should participate. And I was like, oh, duh. Right. Um, it just shows that it's not this again, it's not this us, them, it's a we, we are learning um, and teaching one another simultaneously. Um, also, this participate piece, you know, our BOB this season is very much um, 
grounded in, in dialectical behavior therapy skills. And that is something I'm trained in. And the reason for this is because there are so many practical skills, like emotion regulation skills, mindfulness skills. Emotion regulation is really when our emotions are kind of you know, going overboard, or we feel like we can't control them, this impulsivity. What are like practical skills, right, that you can use to to shift in the moment and make wise mind decisions and, and walk a path? And so a lot of those skills are very, um, I wouldn't say prescriptive, but they're like, they're like, they can, they can be generalized, right? And they can be really adapted. So mindfulness specifically can be adapted to do a slew of different things. Um, but really when we're talking about tipping like the physiology or body chemistry of someone who's experiencing emotional distress, well, that, that kind of can go, you know, using cold water. So what are these actual practical skills that youth can use like throughout, throughout their day, throughout their week to say, yes, this is great that we're talking about all these beautiful things and I need to get through this really hard moment and build a life that is not just suffering, but that is actually like tolerable and, and maybe even enjoyable. Um, so that's really the participate. It's both on the clinician part and encouraging the youth to participate, doing things they're uncomfortable with, right? Turning on their camera if they can, right? If their resources and their means allow it, um, asking them to be silly, letting them be kids, like, you know, we do a lot of things in group that are like, I want you to wag your eyebrows. And, you know, for a lot of youth, it's like, oh, but when do they have time to like be, have fun, right? There are moments for fun. And so participating is hard. There are judgments. There are, you know, especially if there's like identity struggles and judgments that they receive so often. So we really want to like, this is a safe place. It is a community that we build. And lastly, um, evaluate. I like, this is one of the biggest things. So, you know, we've driven this home a lot, um, but do your own work, right? So there are moments when you are going to be uncomfortable there. So really knowing when you want to hold your tongue, when you feel un uncomfortable saying, this is how I identify, when something in the group or something challenges your own faith, right? Um, I think that, you know, it's finding the commonalities. It's doing your own work outside of the group. Um, because a lot of group work and being a part of a community is being authentically yourself. And so if you don't, if you're not feeling authentic, um, you know, that's going to come through whether in your behaviors or your nonverbal. So I can't stress that enough. Yeah. And I think one of the uh, real benefits to the approach that we've been taking is that really, you know, Maggie is able to come from a very non-Indigenous place and say, hey, that there's these skills um, that are helpful. And then we have other folks on our team who have the traditional knowledge to say that, hey, we've actually been doing this for, for millennia. You know, when you're talking about tipping physiology, what do you think we're doing in a sweat lodge? When you're talking about mindfulness practice, um, you know, when we're, when we're smudging, when we're engaging in prayer, that's another way that we're engaging in the same types of processes. Um, and so it's really interesting to talk to young people about, you know, you know, what does this practice make you think of when you think about your own culture, your own practices, and then giving them um, some of the teachings that might, you know, make those skills a little more meaningful. We just wanted to, to share a few of our takeaways um, while we've been working with young people through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we know that this is a challenging time for us. It's challenging for young people. It's challenging to connect. Um, it's really challenging for everyone. Um, and so here are some tips that if you're interested in supporting in, uh, Indigenous youth in your own communities, um, that you might want to think about, particularly um, around the principles that we've been talking about. So first is to make it accessible. We really need to go to where youth are at and participate in their own life. Um, and so that's why we've been engaging online. We know that young people are online right now. Um, hopefully one day we will not have to be online all the time, but make things accessible as possible. Um, if there are barriers, try to reduce the barriers. Um, send send some equipment so they can get online or um, you know, adapt your practice so that it is uh, accessible to them. Follow the community lead. So um, defer to the community when when you're approaching anybody you know what are what are the needs of the community at the time don't try to assume building our bundle really came out of a need that came from particular communities we had been working with and so we're trying our best to to address that need and we continuously reevaluate you know are we actually addressing the needs has the, how have the needs changed can we uh, adapt our approach in order to fit those needs now involve family and community so like Maggie was saying really think about the other people in 
uh, young person's life who are there to be helpers as well. We're not the only people who are going to save someone. And we really reject that kind of uh, mentality that we are, you know, a singular person who's going to save someone's life. Um, that's just not realistic. And so we always want to encourage them to seek out the other relationships that they have in their community, in their lives, that's going to be supportive to them. Um, built capacity. So we always want to scaffold skills for Indigenous young people, you know, to be able to support their own communities. We know that young people are the leaders in their communities. And so, you know, maybe, yeah, they're struggling a little bit in a, in a particular instance. How can we build capacity so that they can actually teach what they're learning to others um, and be a support for others if that's something that they want to do? Practice reciprocity. Um, so like Maggie said, really about that self-disclosure, understanding that relationships are two ways. We can't expect young people to give and give and give and give when we're not also giving as well. And so um, be yourself and be candid, obviously practice appropriate boundaries, but ensure that you know, you're practicing appropriate relationships. And um, number six is check your bias. So be careful not to assume you know what's best or acceptable. Allow young people to guide the healing journey and be mindful of the cultural biases you're holding. But also, you know, sometimes even our elders can um, inadvertently be putting on their biases. And, and I would never question our elders, but to ensure that we don't also assume that culturally there's a right way or culturally there's one way to do things. We really want to practice non-judgmental approaches when working with young people and allow them to make their own choices. Not all those choices are going to be the best, um, but there are their choices to make. And so we, we want to be you know, non-biased when we are working with young people.